Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Tulia, um, born and raised down there, and went to A&M, and then moved to Kansas. Um, so I think this is my fourth or fifth year with the Master Irrigator Program, and they've asked me to talk about remote sensing. Um, I used to talk about remote sensing in general, and then talk about <coughs> drones and, and some things you need to worry about there, but um, I was talking to Harold Grow earlier in the year, and, and he talked to me about maybe uh, talking more about precision ag along with the remote sensing. So the last half of my presentation is more about precision ag in general um, versus just kind of ties in the remote sensing plus the precision ag piece. Um, but my presentation is really informal. Um, it, based on the last presentation, it didn't look like y'all were uh, too scared to ask questions. So I look forward to uh, the questions that you might have. I know. Uh, Frank up here might give me a hard time and call me out if I say something inappropriate. Uh, but anyways, um, a, lot of, a lot of you have probably seen some kind of satellite imagery or some kind of imagery on your farms. Um, pretty much all the major uh, retail outlets are now delivering imagery, uh, whether it's coming from Climate or in Circa or um, any other online platform that you might be using. Um, but I'm going to talk kind of about some different things that you might be not be aware of, um, how you might be able to use it, and those kinds of things. Um, real quick on, on CropQuest, this is kind of our trade territory. Um, you know, we're, we're right in the middle of it here. Um, but we're going into our 29th year, 27th year, sorry. Um, but we are, our big thing is we're 100% employee owned, we're 100% independent. Um, so um, as a employee, I am also an owner. Um, so that, I mean, just like you guys on your farms, you're, you have a vested interest in that success. And so um, we try to do the best job we possibly can because we are only providing service and we don't have any kind of uh, output or inputs that we're selling that, that help us out for the next year. Um, the Precision Ag Team, uh, our role with our agronomists is to uh, train them up on all the new technologies and you know, we believe that the agronomics uh, is really where the Precision Ag starts at. So uh, we're there to, to train them and then continue to evaluate new technologies like uh, how we can continue to use remote sensing or uh, new variable rate technologies um, to better service uh, you guys as growers. So uh, you guys are here to learn you know, new perspectives on different things, uh, new opportunities that might be, be out there. Uh, but here's some different quotes that we've heard on, on why you might not want to implement uh, new technologies on your farm, uh, specifically variable rate technologies. Uh, how many of y'all have said this or heard this from your dad or your grandpa at some point? Uh, my field is flat and doesn't have any variability. The Texas Panhandle, hear that all the time. Southwest Kansas, hear it all the time. Uh, I know where the good and the bad spots are in my field. Most people say, I've been farming this ground for 40 years. I can tell you exactly where it'll produce and where it won't. But well, we understand that. But we need it in a geospatial format so we can do something with it. Or I've done it for 30 years. Well, yeah. And then how's it going to pay? And hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I do talk about some prices um, on different things. Because um, usually I end up getting asked that anyway, so I just throw it in the presentation. That way it gets answered and then we can move forward. Uh, so my objective, I'm going to give you um, all the facts that, that I know and you know, make your own determination and then hopefully show you where you can make some improvements or um, maybe a different way of thinking and then uh, maybe may provide you with a valid reason for making an investment. So this is probably one of the key things on remote sensing uh, is, is managing your expectations. Uh, the reality is not every image that you get throughout the season is going to actually show you something. Um, and what I mean by that is you may not see a, an issue that you can fix. 
uh, whether it's fixable this year or next year. Um, but you might see a non-bearable image, so which is not a bad thing. Um, the interpretation of the images requires ground truthing, and this is a, a really key thing. So if somebody tells you that they can tell you what is going on in your field by just looking at an image, um, you ought to call them out on it. Um, because a lot of these images that are being provided are just showing you um, maybe where stress is or, or where it's not. And as you all know, there's a lot of things that can cause stress um, to a plant, whether it's fertility, uh, you know, pH, uh, dryness, um, could be a whole lot of things. And then what can you do if an issue is found? Are you set up to do um, an in-season application of, of uh, nitrogen? Are you um, able to do any kind of variable rate application? Um, so those are the kinds of things that, um, you know, even if you are getting these things, can you do something about it? And then image presentation is a major influencer on perception. And I'll show this here in just a little bit, but some companies show images with different color scales to make you feel better about what you're seeing out there. And I don't feel like that's a, a good way to do business, but uh, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then go into each image in, with an open mind. Let it show you where the issues are and where they're not. And, and then that's where the ground truthing comes in to figure out what's going on. Um, so, these are different ways that we, we uh, deliver imagery. Um, we've got uh, different reports that we send out. Um, so, a lot of you, if you're using, how many of you are using climate and getting imagery that way? Quite a few. Some other platform? Okay. So, um, so what we typically do, we've got our NDVI image over here on the, on the left-hand side. Um, and NDVI stands for Normalized Difference Vegetative Index. Um, sounds like a really intense word, but um, it's just basically we're looking at the amount of greenness out there. Um, this is an early season image, um, but we've got our NDVI and then we also have our, our color infrared there on the right. Um, basically, we've got that image there. Uh, right here so we can see do we have clouds or shadows that that allows us to quality control that really quickly um, Then we've got it on our mobile platform uh, Where we can actually go out there and ground truth the images see what's going on And then we also have it in our farm management program uh, Where we can maybe make some variable rate applications or or tie that back with all of our scouting information So you'll see two different color scales here. Uh, we've got a fixed color scale here on the left, and then we've got a relative color scale on the right. And whenever we deliver images to our growers, we try to take a very simple approach. Um, you know, you guys have a ton of things that you have to worry about on a daily basis, and thinking about, you know, if, if all these images were just yellow to green, or red to green, you'd have to think way too hard about why are, these are different dates, why do they all kind of look the exact same with the color scale. So as we progress through the season, uh, we're progressing along our, our color scale. So whenever we look at a gray, it's a gray, it's a gray, um, then we transition out of that. So they all match. If it's a 0.2 on the NDVI scale, then it's a 0.2 across there and the colors match. Um, but whenever we get into uh, our ground truthing, um, I think there's a video there. Like whenever we're ground truthing, we want to actually be able to really pull out the variability in those fields and, and to surf, decipher, you know, where are some important spots that we need to look at uh, when we're actually out there scouting those fields. And I can go from, from five classes to as many classes as I want. In this example, I'm going to go to 31 classes, and it really pulls out. Um, I'll show you an example here in a minute, but that little green spot right there is um, actually some pigweeds that showed up in some 
early season soybeans. But we've got two different ways for two different uses. One, communicating with our growers. The second one, whenever we're, we're actually scouting those fields. So going back to what we're using whenever we communicate with our growers. So we've got this fixed color scale. And you can see as we progress through the season. So we'll, here we've got a June 2nd image. We're at about G6 uh, to, or V6 to V7, uh, 14 inches approximately on, on the corn. Uh, this had a, a variable rate seeding application, lighter seed population up in the north corner and a higher population in the bottom. You can see that transition as we go through uh, the season. So some of this is what we would expect to see based on our variable rate population. Um, and then there's a few other things that are happening, you know, in, in these two spots that, you know, those could be the tops of some sand hills, um, or there could be some kind of other issue. But that's that's why we use that fixed color scale so that whenever we communicate with our growers, like it's a, we only have to educate them once on what the color scale means and while while we're seeing that transition. No variability equals a bad thing. So I have had my butt chewed for having images that look like this. Uh, we, we used to charge by the image and whenever growers would get images like this and there was something we could do something with it, they were happy, they said, all right, we see something going on. But then whenever they had an image that nothing was, no issues looked like they were out there, it was, well, why did I pay for this? I knew it was all good. So, but we don't know that until we actually see the images. Um, so it's just because there's nothing showing up out there does not mean, you know, that's a bad thing. So uh, it's all in, all in perspective. If you don't take anything else away from today, um, take this away. Um, you cannot utilize the remote sense imagery without ground truthing it. Uh, the data is, is a guide, not, not the answer. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about this again later, but um, ground truthing is key with this stuff. So imagery in the field, and this is, this is to prove my point on why it's important. So this was some uh, corn. We've got a, a five foot penetrometer here. Can you see that in the back? Got yeah. um, In this image, you can see it's kind of in an orange spot, um, which would be uh, kind of in the middle of our or NDVI scale. So we were trying to figure out what, what was going on here. Why, why is this corn not doing as well as this corn? So this here, we're in the middle of the screen. Uh, you can barely see the penetrometer there. And whenever you look at the, the height difference, so we got to talking with the grower, and I mean, it was pretty obvious when we got out there, but uh, what, what happened was the hired man had been closing uh, irrigation ruts with, um, with his uh, closer and had his three point where it was swaying. And then he went out with the field cultivator and didn't lock his three point in. And whenever he was cultivating this field, it got into the, into the corn. And so we have some cultivator black right there. <laughs> you ever seen that happen before? Yeah. So, you know, if somebody uses some kind of algorithm to tell you what happened out there, most of the time they're not going to account for human error. They're going to say, well, that's a fertility issue or it is a fertility issue. It is a, a, a water issue because the roots are, you know, half cut off. And so the, it can't uptake uh, what it needs to there. But um, it had nothing to do with actual soil. It was user error. So uh, that's just a, a, a point there for, you know, you have to ground truth this stuff. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of technologies where we can utilize what we find in the field and kind of extrapolate that out based on, on some patterns we're seeing, but it still requires that, that ground truthing. So here's a field. Um, 
In southwest Kansas, we have some high pH issues, which affects our, our soybeans. And so we did a, a chelated iron uh, prescription. And I'm gonna feel like I'm really loud. Okay, is that okay still? It was better when it was Okay. It just feels like I'm getting some feedback. All right. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so I, I took my drone out there. You can see my flight path. Um, and when I was out there, this was a prescription that we used. And so I was just trying to see how things worked or didn't work. And when I was out there, I saw this kind of bright green within the, the soybeans there. And it's like, what the heck is that? So I uh, zoomed down on it. It was just a big uh, bunch of pigweeds. It was a, a sprayer skip. And, but it, it showed up really well. Um, but it, it provides a good visual for how different color scales or different ways we can, we can classify those images really pull out some different variables. Um, so this would be how we would normally look at it, um, but you, you saw earlier how I changed those color scales to really highlight some of that stuff, and that's really what, what this one kind of shows, um, and that's exactly where that pigweed spot was. Um, we've seen some, some companies out there that will use just a green hue because they think that uh, growers want to see their field in a, in a green light because green is good. Um, but in reality, you want to see what is happening, right? You don't want to have any surprises on, on what's going on out there. So, you know, which image is more valuable? Well, they all have different value in their own, in their own right. It just kind of depends on what's going on out there. And this is just uh, showing that same thing. So how many of y'all are growing cotton? Majority of y'all. Um, how many of you have seen fields with cotton with variable uh, with sizes about like that? So what what we can do um, with some of these issues, especially with cotton, is we can put out a, a variable rate PGR, and you know we're, we really want to try to even that field out. So we could put out um, a 12 ounce rate versus a, a full rate of 24. And you know, hopefully, kind of even that field out. Um, you know, I know there's different products and stuff out there. They do different things, but um, maybe it's not a cost that you're going to save a whole lot on. But it, there is options out there for for doing some variable rate growth regulators on your cotton. Uh, here's some other things that we can do with it: um, VR seeding, fertility irrigation. Um, in season top dressing, side dressing, and, and your growth regulators. Uh, some more, some more things that we can do with this. Um, so, living in Dodge City, we've got a casino there. Um, people like to be a little bit uh, risky with their money, I guess. And as growers, you like to be a little bit risky. You're lifelong gamblers because the weather is our great unknown. Uh, but with the imagery, uh, we can kind of stack the deck in our favor. Uh, here was a, a field where we had a, a well dropping off and it was nozzled for like 500 gallons a minute and turns out it, it dropped down as they went and started, everybody started their pivots up for the season and it was blowing air in the first two towers. And so we were able to go out there and fix that. Uh, we didn't solve the issue because well, we, we solved the problem, but we didn't, there was already damage done. So we, basically what we did was uh, reduce the amount of, of damage uh, that, that could have happened. Uh, we're also getting a, a basically a yield map in the, in the middle of the season. Um, about a month after planting, you're going to get a really good idea of where your productive areas are going to be versus your non-productive areas. And so if you're not yield mapping, this might be a good substitute um, for knowing you know, where, where you have some areas to improve. How many of you are doing input trials on your farm? Nobody? Okay. All right. We have test plots. Yeah, test plots. Um, so 
how are you how are you checking your test plots to see what worked or didn't work? Just weighing what was harvest. Yeah. So at the end of the season, you're you're able to see what produced or didn't produce, or what the differences were. Mm -hmm. So what we're able to do with the input or with our with the imagery is see okay throughout the season how did that test plot perform versus the rest of the field. So we get that full story versus just getting the yield difference at the end of the year. Because um, depending on, you know, if it was a cool, wet, uh, early season versus a, a dry late or vice versa, um, they could produce differently. Um, and so that, that allows us to get a full, full story of, wh of what's going on out there. Um, in this particular case, uh, we've got uh, two varieties, uh, 70 mile an hour winds. One variety didn't st stand up to it. Uh, we had green snap. Um, you don't necessarily need a uh, imagery map to show that half the field is laying on the ground, but um, if there were some differences there, um, you know that's something that you could utilize and send to your uh, insurance agent to, to help get a better uh, insurance claim there. In this particular case, uh, we had a, a guy that saw me at the 3 I show a few years ago and asked me, he said he had a, a Milo, dryland Milo, and he had put some uh, fungicide on it and on half and, and not the other half, and he's like, man, it's really performing well. And so we looked at the imagery, and this was the after image of, of after he had applied it, and sure enough, you know, you can see that difference of one half versus the other. But I said, well, let's look where you started at and to do our due diligence. And sure enough, you can still see that there's a split there. So I said, well, something else must be happening because we're still seeing that split line. So uh, we went back and looked several years before that, and we still see that split. So we got to talking and this was some rented ground and the previous tenant used to always do a wheat fallow rotation right there on that line. So it was a previous farming practice that was making an impact, not necessarily his fungicide application. So, you know, it's, we're seeing all these things that are happening in the field and we're just trying to, you know, check off the boxes and say what is happening or what is not happening. And as uh, crop consultants, you know, our biggest fear is not catching everything that's out in the field. Um, so this was a case of um, where, where the imagery really come into play. Um, so we, we get this satellite image and we see these rings out there. And the first thought would be, well, there's irrigation issues out there. Uh, this was a field of, of oats. And the, the agronomist that was on this ground did not see that issue when he was out there in the field. So uh, I went out there and flew it with the drone. And whenever you start looking down, straight down into those, into the oats, you can really start seeing how thin it is there around the pivot point. And it really wasn't irrigation related. It was more uh, tied to compaction uh, where they had had cut that for, for silage the previous year. But, you know, how many of y'all have wheat? So whenever you walk out there and you look across that wheat field, it looks really good, right? But whenever you walk out there, and you, you'll see a thinner stand whenever you're looking straight down. That's basically what we're seeing here. So for us as agronomists, or you as a farmer, this is just a double check, whether uh, you're double checking your agronomist or you know, if you're out there scouting your own stuff, uh, this is just a good, it allows you to quickly look at that whole field and see if something is going on out there that you missed. Uh, we do have some new imagery options. And there, there's always new ones coming out. That, um, but aerial is, is starting to become a, a cheaper option. Um, before it was about 250 per flight or so, um, but they're able to get, get it down to basically $2.50 for the whole season uh, for 15 flights. Uh, it's, it's a very affordable thing whenever you put it out there per flight. 
but uh, natural color thermal NDVI and, and then the color infrared. Uh, the thing that I like about this is we can see not clogged nozzles a lot sooner in a thermal image than we can in an NDVI image. And this is um, a June 15 image. So it was July 2nd before we were able to see it show up in the corn. <clears throat> we were able to see it in the middle of June right there. So, um, you know, how does that pay? You know, this is a this is 120 acre circle, 250 an acre, 300 bucks. So just this little spot is two acres. You would think two acres is not that big a deal, right? But how many of y'all seen clog nozzles turn irrigated acres into dryland acres real quick? And what's that yield, yield difference? Um, you know, it could be a lot greater than 50 bushel. So 50 bushels on two acres at 350 corn pays for that real quick. Um, you know, if it was on the outside tower, yeah. So, um, you know, not saying this is going to happen every time, but it's, a, it's just like your insurance policy. You know, you hope you don't have to use it, um, but it is very valuable when you do have to use it. Um, I will point out a few things with the UAVs. This is kind of how we, we utilize them at CropQuest. Um, so we had this field and the grower wanted to, he had some um, corn borer issues and he was trying to figure out taking some corn for wet grain versus dry grain and he wanted to take his, his lodge corn for wet grain. Basically all these spots like here, here, down here was where we were having our, um, our root rot or our corn borer issues. And so the agronomist had been out there, ground truth it, told him where they were at, but the grower didn't necessarily believe him. So we, we went out and took pictures with the drone. And this picture here, you can see, it's, it's kind of hard to see up here, but um, you can tell it's, it's lodging, you see some ground there. But that correlates with this, this spot right here, the drone was, about right here, looking back over to the east. And here we flew out to the pivot point and we're looking back towards the west. And you can see this spot here, and this spot here, and these are, those are these two spots there. And then if we look back where you can see the pivot point and then back over towards the east, you can really see those spots there right around the pivot point. So for, for our use in this case, it was just educating the grower on what we are seeing in the imagery and you know being able to trust what the image is showing us um, you know it's a all this new technology is still a learning process for everybody and um, the more things that we can do to help educate ourselves educate you guys um, you know it's a it's a ongoing process so you know, the question is, which one will work best for you? Um, you know, there's <coughs> different options on, on the satellite side. You can go from free to $2.50 an acre. I think Farmer's Edge has a, has a program where they're somewhere in that $2.50 <coughs> range. Um, but you're going to be 5 meter to 30 meter um, on resolution, somewhere in there. And then one day to 16 days on, on your uh, repeat on when you get new images. On the aerial side, um, there's some different options out there. You can get some services for uh, about six, three to six bucks an acre. Um, but basically, these are, these are the ones that I find um, price-wise, like if you're gonna spend money, don't pay more than that. It's kind of where I'm at. Um, that's that's kind of the, your value proposition on, on what you're gonna get. Um, these would be, what I would recommend. And then what kind of user are you going to be? A lot of guys that I've seen that have uh, field view or they're just having imagery flow in and it's just you as the grower that, that has access to it. A lot of what I see is that you're a very passive user. So passive mean I have it, 
but I'm not going to look at it until you know things that are, have already escalated to the point where we can't do anything about it. Um, so you know, we have active users, which what I would say those guys that are actively out there in the field um, have it in their their scouting programs. Um, you know, whether that's your agronomist or you as an individual, um, but. Those are the ones that are looking at it as soon as it comes in. Um, we do have some imagery evaluation services that are available, and basically we help turn you into an active user. Um, you know, we're monitoring that for basically irrigation issues is really what we're looking for. Um, you know, sending you text message alerts or, or emails saying, hey, this field has some kind of issue. You know, somebody needs to go check that out. Um, so on the imagery side, you know, it's, it gives you an educated eye with boots on the ground. Uh, hopefully it gives you that, that advantage with um, in the game of risk management. And we can utilize that to put our inputs where, where they need to be. And then allows us to act and instead of react in some cases. Any questions on the imagery side before I go into more of a precision ag talk? How, can y'all see some of those things whenever you looked at your field view imagery versus, you know, maybe something else? So, if I say anything out of line, y'all, they all let me know because I'm a, I'm always learning as well. So, um, as I mentioned, Harold asked me to talk more about precision type stuff, variable rate applications, and, and some data sets we can use with that. Uh, we've got this, our Precision Ag Toolbox, um, and we say common sense applied uh, innovatively. You know, you, you all have your different tools for, diff for fixing different issues, and there's always a different tool on the precision side to fix different issues, whether it's um, fertility or a pH issue or, um, you know, like the guy was talking about, variable frequency drives before. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of those that we're using with variable rate irrigation systems. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it's combining those tools and sometimes it's utilizing a new tool uh, that you have never used before. We always have people that ask, where do I start with Precision Ag? Um, you may be, you know, looking at a new planter or a new strip till rig or um, a new sprayer and you don't know you know, you want it to have some capabilities, but you don't know exactly what is a hot button issue for you. We do have a tool on our website that allows you to rank certain, there's like 17 di different questions that allows you to rank certain issues on your farm or concerns that, that you might have. And then it kind of points you in a direction uh, for, for where you might want to go. Um, we've got guys that are varying everything from you know, their seed fertility and even hybrids to guys that are just variable rating their seeding rates from irrigated to dry land. And it's whatever you're comfortable with. You know, it, it doesn't matter if you're advanced or unadvanced, you know, we're here to help. Uh, grid soil sampling, you know, there's a lot of different things. A lot of people promote grid sampling. Uh, we, our typical uh, spacing on that is two and a half acres. Uh, are you concerned with proper fertility levels? Uh, pH really isn't an issue here. Um, so what we typically do with a grid sample, so we've got, here's where the imagery plays in. And if you had a, a, a yield map, this would also help with that. But basically, we want to identify variability. You know, do we have a reason for uh, spending some extra money figuring out what is our our issue in this field. So we've identified the variability, then we go out and take our soil samples. Each soil sample is, is marked with a GPS, so we can go back in, in our successive years and take different, uh, our directed point samples. We analyze those results, and in this case, I'm showing an example of, of soil pH. This was in central Oklahoma. Um, you can see there some, some really low pHs. But if this was a, you know, 
we're looking at P or K in this area, you know, it, it could look very similar to that. Um, then our variable rate rec, and the important part, getting it into your monitor. Um, a lot of times, whenever we do some precision ag work with people, um, it's, well, what do I do after I get all this data? You know, how do I deal with my monitor? You know, it's a, it's a pain in several different facets. Uh, but we, we try to work really close with your uh, implement dealers to make sure that you're updated on your planter or your sprayer um, and in the, in the cab because if they're on different updates, they may not communicate very well. Um, here's an ex just a quick video to show uh, what, we, what it looks like when we're out there grid sampling. So typically we'll be out there with a group of us because we like to get it done uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, the first guy, it may not play. Well, anyways, so the first guy is going to be dropping points. Um, he's going to drop the bags. And then we've got the, the rest of the team that basically is leapfrogging each other to, to grab those, those points. So uh, with a team of four, we can get a field knocked out really quick. Um, we can get those soil samples sent off and get the results back uh, quickly so that you guys can get uh, whatever fertilizer put down uh, that you want to get. Mm -hmm. So uh, for y'all, more or less the, your P and K are going to be most of, of what you're really worried about in this area. Um, that first year you can, you can use the nitrogen, but since it's a mobile nutrient, um, in, in successive years, it may not be necessarily be, these, our grid maps may not be the best maps for, uh, for making reverberate nitrogen rates. And we always get asked questions, what do, we, what do we do in the years that we're not gridding? So this is typically a four or five year plan. Um, so in years two, three, and four, in five, we'll pull our directed samples, and then we addressed our prescriptions based on, on what those directed points were. And then we'll, we'll re-pull those grids on the fifth or sixth year. So um, we do some reverberate manure applications. This is an example for that. Um, here's where all of our grid sample points were and what our um, P was there. There's what our... our uh, our directed samples were, and we can see we had an increase in each one of our each one of our directed point samples. So our basically that manure is doing what it's supposed to be doing. You know, this is just a um, verification that that we're getting that uh, year to year an improvement by using the variable manure. And the key thing is. There was no need for an application that second year, so um, that's a a good reason why we why we do this because we may not necessarily have to make that application the next one. In this one, uh, let's see, this was a uh, same thing. All right, commercial fertilizer. So in this case, we did have some some drop in in some of these and an increase in other ones. Um, so it, it, it allows us to adjust our, our prescriptions accordingly. Um, I'm going to speed through these because I'm, I'm almost out of time. Um, so we've, we've got our, our ECEM maps that we can also collect. Uh, basically what we're doing is using electrical conductivity to identify um, our different soil properties. So if it's um, let me just show you. So if we've got sandy soil or more clay soil, uh, we actually ran our dual EM sensor out here on this farm. Uh, they're going to be utilizing that in the next um, few years on different studies they're going to be doing. Um, but basically, <coughs> this was in one field. Um, you know, if you've got more clay in a field or more um, cleachy, those kinds of things, that allows us to identify those see what you know, our water holding capacities are, what our fertility is doing there, and how we might want to make, uh, whether it's a verbal seating or a fertility rack, uh, we, can, we can do that based on these things. I'm going to 
speed through this. Same kind of concept. Um, taking all of this information, tying it together, and putting it into, in this particular case, a, a seating rack. Um, you know, it's all about data layers and being able to identify what is a contributing factor for why you have a yield loss in that area. Um, and it may not necessarily be that we're going to be pushing your bushels in every acre, but it's, it may be just cutting your input costs um, so you're not wasting, uh, you're not putting out fertility or seeding, seeding rates for 250 bushel corn on areas that aren't going to produce anything more than 200. Uh, you're just throwing money down the drain. So uh, that's kind of what we're trying to do here is, is identify those areas and let's maximize each acre uh, for, for what its potential is. Uh, the variable irrigation, this is something else that we can do um, with our ECEM maps. Uh, we can utilize elevation and slope. Um, but what we can do is we run that through a, an evaluator tool and say, um, which one of these might be the best map for, um, for doing a variable rate map? And we can say, um, like in this particular case, slope was a, a huge one, 73% uh, variability before, and afterwards we were able to cut that down to 52. So you'll see these are just in the sector control, so basically we're just doing it by speed. Uh, most of y'all are using like pivot track or um, some other kind of telemetry system on your pivots. And we can tie these right into that so there's no huge um, upfront cost on, on doing it. Um, if you get into the, the different sector controls, uh, those systems are very expensive. Um, but these options are available. Uh, water management, uh, if you've got water holes out there in the field, um, you know, doing something about those, making water drain, um, you know, typically in our area, we're not trying to get water off in too fast a way, but um, if it's ponding and, and causing uh, drown out issues, uh, that's definitely a, an issue. Um, we work with uh, a company out of uh, Kansas, that, a Trimble dealer there, that we basically collect all the data and then they, they make it what is a cut and fill map. Uh, basically it's a prescription for I need to cut and fill, or if you've got terraces that need to be cleaned out, uh, we, can, we can do those too. Did I reach my time? You've got 10 minutes left, I don't know. Oh, I thought you said, I thought that said five minutes. Oh, I missed the, I missed the one. Uh, so, anyways. You showed some maps of iron chlorosis. Yeah. So, how do you, what's your, what's the cure for that? So, uh, iron chlorosis, and let me just preface this by I'm not an agronomist, so I'm just a precision ag guy uh, talking uh, based on what my agronomists have said. But So what we do uh, with iron chlorosis areas, those are created by high pH areas, and we are, we're not trying to lower that pH, we're just trying to manage around it. So we're putting out a, a chelated iron, uh, there's different products out there um, from different uh, retailers, but um, We'll put out a chelated iron, like in furrow with our soybeans, and, and we see a, a bump on that. So basically we're going from growing no soybeans to could be five to 15 bushel soybeans on those areas. So you're looking at like a, uh, if it's soy green, it's about an $18 application. Um, I think they call for three, three pounds, and it's six bucks a pound. Um, so you go from, uh, zero to five and uh, it costs you 18 bucks and what's the soybean, what's the soybean price right now? Oh, I said 50. 750, okay. With basis. Yeah, so um, like the chelated iron does not pay on the acres that, that doesn't have the pH issue. So if we can just concentrate on those areas, um, you know, you can see around a $27 an acre increase if you're getting that five dollar, how come you're not trying to change the pH? Because to me, you should be trying to somehow change the pH. What are your options on 
trying to do that either with uh, elemental sulfurs or some, some of the other pro yeah. products out there. I guess manure could have formed. Yeah, so uh, what, what people tell me is that uh, whenever we're trying to lower that pH, it's not to get the impact out of it, it, it's not as economical as, like it's a lot easier to raise pH than it is to lower pH. Because you're trying, you got to put that acid out there to get it lower and there's no real, basically you have to have a chemical reaction to create that acid and get it to, to uh, lower. So managing around it is a more economical way than trying to change it. That's pretty short term. That's just for that specific one year, one right. cropping situation. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's very short term. It, that iron is, is, is gobbled up right quick that you add in there, and it's not a very effective process. Now, we, I tried some last year, and I wasn't very impressed. You didn't, you didn't get it. I ran the soy green. Yeah. yeah. But there's something better than soy green. Every year. Yeah, there's one that starts with a B or something. I can't remember exactly what it is. but. Um, We've, we've seen some, uh, I've seen some people that have done uh, some, uh, run their uh, chelated iron through the pivot and had some good response. That that's that's what I did. Uh, yeah. we, we were kind of late and it was bad and I thought, well, I'm just going to try this and see yeah. what it does. And I, I say, I couldn't see that it's, yeah. it's a lot, made it a little bigger. I know, like if you get it in, like where we've seen the biggest bump is where you're doing it in furrow, in like with with the seed, because it's really trying to protect that uh, seed or make that nutrient available first thing so you can get that plant up. And then... Um, that little plant's about six inches high over the top of the end. Yeah, that's where I've, we're um, doing it through the pivot might be a benefit also. But it's, it's hard to be so specific with that pivot. Right, yeah, that that's where you have the issue of, of doing that, so. Um, at least you can be specific when you're doing an in furrow. Um, but yes, that is the, the kicker of going through the pivot. Any other questions? Yes? On one of your job slides, you showed the aluminum toxicity. What's the source of the aluminum? Um, so, I couldn't tell you. I'm not sure. Uh, we utilize these slides in a, different, a lot of different places, so I'm not exactly sure um, in what use case that was. So if I try to tell you, I would be lying to you. I like the box. <laughs> well, I, Frank and Paul have both seen me talk before. Yeah, I think I've talked to Frank a lot of times on the phone. He knows I'll tell him if I don't know the answer. So. Um, it's a lot easier to say I don't know and get back to you than tell you a lie and lose your confidence. So. And I want to know here. Yeah. These, this satellite imagery that I get on Sirius. Yeah. Does Mark make use of that on my phone? Well, Mark would be the one that could answer it, but I, he should be. I mean, is that is that what it's designed for? That's what it's designed for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The way that. The way that our system works is, uh, so we utilize uh, what used to be uh, SST is now ProAgrica, uh, their software company out of Stillwater, Oklahoma. Um, we use their software, uh, Cirrus and Summit, and we have our own reporting software that pulls all the data that we put into that, um, and that's how we have our, our scouting reports and recommendations and stuff flow to our farmers. And along with that, we have our satellite imagery flow into that program. So it's, whenever he's looking at his field reports that he's gonna be sending to you, he also has that. Um, so he can look at your farm, you know, in a quick you know, scroll of his PDF on his phone. So he should be, yeah. And then he also has it in Sirius when he's scouting, so. That's the best answer I can give you without speaking for Mark. Last question or okay, how much does it cost? The which one? Any of it? Any of it, all of it. So um, our the satellite imagery program, um, like we include that with our crop service, uh, but if, if it's something that you want outside of our crop service, 
uh, we will do that. Um, usually, like that the imagery evaluation service that I mentioned, uh, we'll do that on the on the satellite imagery side for a buck an acre. Um, basically, all we need there is, is your field boundaries, and then we can subscribe it to our program and then um, need your email address and your and your phone number so we can send you um, you know notifications on what what we're seeing out there. Uh, the aerial imagery, it is $2.50 an acre. Um, that's for the entire season. You can get uh, 15 flights. That's the, uh, basically they're gonna start flying at the end of May, and then they'll fly um, pretty much every week until September. Um, so you're getting a high resolution image every, every week. I think the first flight, there might be two weeks in between there, but um, the EC uh, soil mapping, um, it starts at 10 bucks an acre. If we end up uh, mapping pH, um, it, if the price goes up from there, we can do um, EC, pH, organic matter. Um, we can map all three of those at the same time. Um, I think the top end with everything is, is about 16 or 17 bucks an acre. Um, the first year we include all of our prescriptions with it, and then after that it's about five bucks an acre um, in the successive years for um, pulling our zone samples and making making the recommendations for the for the following years. But the first year it's all included. Um, the our water management program uh, to collect all the topo data and stuff. Um, there's since we're working with another company in there, um, they have their pricing. I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, but for us to collect that data, it's about eight bucks an acre. Um, and then they have their fee on top of that for uh, processing and making their cut field maps and, and stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think. The, the verbrake irrigation, um, so our first year on that is um, five bucks an acre to make that prescription. Um, but if we have the, the EC layers and stuff, uh, we can run that through the evaluation tool and see is this a good candidate for that field. Um, before you get charged for that initial deal. Um, the thing about variable irrigation is you're going to get like five different prescriptions um, because you can't just use one prescription for the whole year um, because of uh, different growing conditions and um, water uptake and all those kinds of things. So uh, if you like those five in the years, successive years after that, you may just use those same ones. If we don't have to update it, um, then there's no extra price on that. Um, so 